Hi everybody, welcome back to Professors Providing Professional Development. I'm getting better at saying PPPD, mm -hmm. our YouTube channel where we're trying to post as many different things as we can think of uh, in topics that we think are important. And today, we're actually gonna do what uh, is a variation of the first lectures we ever delivered. I know the word lecture has kind of lost favor, but nonetheless, the first lectures we ever did uh, when we taught face-to-face -face our children's and young adult lit classes, especially with undergraduates, uh, because they were, they were messages that maybe they hadn't gotten yet in their teacher education mm -hmm. classes. We no longer get those kids. That elective was cut. Yeah. Uh, thanks to our Texas legislature saying they can't take any more education classes. They need to specialize. Uh, so our students are graduating now without that class. It just absolutely kills us. But we have a way of putting it right in here and then uh, telling our methods and, and other colleagues over in teacher ed that they can make their kids watch this. That's right. Because it's really important. So what we thought we'd talk about today is how we build a community of readers. I think initially this lecture was called uh, 10 Things We Do to Get Kids to Read. Uh, we've kind of come a long way since then. We know that community is important and we know that building a culture of literacy in the school is what's important. So while the title of this might have changed, what's on it mm -hmm. really hasn't. So we're going to uh, talk about these and, and just uh, hoping that you will uh, let us know if we've overlooked anything. Certainly, and we're always always true. happy to add. And these things might be where, where you try and accomplish one or two of these at a time because there's no way that you're probably going to be able to do all of these at one time and expect yourself to already have a community because that does take trust mm -hmm. um, and that yes. takes a little while to build. So, so take some of these and start trying to put these in place slowly. Yeah. So, number one. There are real books in the school. They're in the classroom library. They're in the library library, uh, the school library, the central library, and as much as possible, they're in the home too. Uh, we know from lots of research the effects of a good school library. Mm -hmm. We know from all of the, the research and the replications of the research that have been done um, through American Association of School Librarians that the presence of a certified librarian with an adequate collection is positively correlated to higher test scores. Uh, if you're looking for a way to really make the case for having a school librarian, for having that collection, that's one place for you to start. But we also know since the 1960s about the efficacy of having books in the classroom that even if kids only have to walk to the shelves behind me um, to get to school library, it's important that they're as close as possible. That way I left it in my locker, mm -hmm. I left it at home, uh, whatever, I left it on the playground is just not an excuse. It's go pick one. That's right. Just right over there, pick up whatever you want. And by the way, those libraries include periodicals, fiction, nonfiction, graphic novels, newspapers. picture books, newspapers, yeah. if they still exist. Comic books. <laughs> the comic little books. Individual little flimsy mm -hmm. comic books. I yeah, mean, not absolutely. just graphic novels. And we also know that the number of books in a kid's home is the best predictor yeah. of their success in schools. Look at Stephen Krashen's work. Right. The we power can, of reading. The power of reading. We can tell when we talk to students, and we have talked to students, and they have one or two books in their home, they don't get the chance to get involved in literacy kinds of activities the way that kids who have those materials do. And by the way, I said books. That can mean, by the way, also ebooks, audiobooks, and yeah. especially as summer approaches, we're thinking about the sync audiobooks that give kids two free audiobooks every week to download. Uh, last week it was Grasshopper Jungle was one of the choices, or no, was it the week before? I don't know, but I'm really excited about the choices. Well, I can actually tell you because I've got them. Yeah, this on week my was uh, the, uh, the story of a boy, and uh, I thought then Grasshopper Jungle. Oh, maybe so. But I'm going to tell you because they're here. Yeah, uh, and they're free. Oh. Uh, this week it was Egg and Spoon by Gregory Maguire and Every Last Word. The week yeah. before it was This, this Boy's Life. Life and A Hundred Sideways Miles. Right. That's what it was. And then the week before that was The Sin Eater's Daughter and... Divine Collision. Mm -hmm. And then before that it was The Great Tennessee Monkey Trials and Vivian Apple at the End of the World. I love that book. I do They too. try to pair um, a fiction and a lot of times it's a non-fiction mm -hmm. um, counterpart. 
Um, or a fiction, a, a YA, and a and adult a chill. book. Right, right, right. That's right. true. So free audiobooks. Mm -hmm. I mean, Two you can't a week, just every beat Thursday. That. June is audiobook month. You're seeing this in June. You ought to kind of check that out. So real books, a variety of books, forms, formats. It doesn't matter. But real books in the classroom, in the school library, at home. It helps if they're on buses where kids spend a lot of time. Mm -hmm. My favorite bus driver for years was the one that kept a crate in the front. And kids would get on and he'd say, pick a book. And he never had problems on that bus. The kids would say, well, it's really quiet on this bus because we're all reading. Imagine that. I just thought that was fabulous. Smart bus driver. So, real books. Uh, number two, read aloud occurs regularly. This applies to every grade level. Mm -hmm. High school students like to be read aloud to just as much as the little ones do. So it's, we don't really even need to say much more beyond read alouds occur regularly. It's important for the kids to hear reading aloud. Um, they hear the way cadence, they hear the, the fluency, they hear the way words are pronounced out loud. Uh, yeah. Terry has a good story um, about wafting oh, yeah yeah go ahead yeah. I mean, because she just read it but yeah. if the teacher had read that aloud she would have known she would have known natalie uh, we were uh, doing a renaissance fair and natalie said "Ooh, the smell of fried ice cream is wafting over to me or wafting that's what she called okay. it wafting over to me i knew she had hit that word in print but she hadn't heard it and we all have stories right, like that. We right. all have words we had no idea how they were pronounced till we heard I it for the first time. I had to hear Jim Dale tell me how to say Hermione. Yeah, Hermione you know? and yeah, Hermione. Right. And, yeah, so I remember that So reading aloud gives that kind of knowledge to those kids. We have lots and lots of research on reading aloud and perhaps a future broadcast uh, will be a slide presentation where we review some of Trelise's read aloud yeah. uh, research as well as the replications that have been done because from 1911 there's been research on reading aloud in every single time. Again, high correlation between kids who do better on tests who are read aloud to. It's just this is not a fluke. Mm -hmm. So number three, um, we should share books with kids in large, small, and individual groups. I guess you can't have an individual group, but you know what I mean here. Uh, not only are we doing book talks in front of great gobs of kids. Um, or just your classroom. Or just your classroom, but we're also going up to individual kids and saying, I noticed that you have uh, a new dog. You talked about that in class. There are some really cool books that I found in the library on how to train your new dog. Would you be interested in those? It's just telling kids, I know what the things you're interested in, I know the kinds of things that might appeal to you. And to do that uh, individually, but also to do what I call scattershot, which is in the big group where you hope something sticks to the wall, because you're just going to talk about a whole wide range of books. That goes toward building that trust. Mm -hmm. The kid is going to know they can come to you to ask about a book recommendation, because you have known them, you knew them well enough to say, you're going to probably like this book. Or you might need this book right now, as far as the training the puppy goes and stuff. Um, we're not talking about bibliotherapy. No. Not talking no, about that kind of need. That. Not talking about need it because your parents are going through a divorce, read this. We are not talking about that. This was simply, here's how to train your dog. That's different. Bibliotherapy is best left to the counselor. That's right. That um, is not a librarian's mm -hmm. job. I'm a school librarian, elementary and middle school. I'm not... A counselor and when uh, for example when I lost a pet um, and when you get to be our age you lose mm. pets the last thing I want is a dying pet oh to be my God. See Karen that's the last thing I would have given her when she lost her puppy it's the last thing I would want somebody to give me right. and yet somebody tried to give my youngest a book about a dead parent when her mother died mm. that was not the kind of book that that kid needed right. she needed funny books that's right. so, we were we were doing grief we we knew how to do grief but Oh, just please don't tell my kid that this is the book you need. Yeah. Um, let the counselor do. That's right. So I, just want, I wanted to make sure that <laughs> yeah, that absolutely. I'm is glad different you did that. from absolutely. what we were talking about. Yeah, definitely. You know, definitely, how to train your dog is totally a safe topic yeah, it's, to recommend. It's okay. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Oh, so there again. Yeah, the trust. Right. That's good. Okay. Silent number four. Silent reading time at school every day. This is one that I know is going to be a tough one to sell, because principals are going to be pushing back on teachers using their class time for silent reading when they think they should be focusing on 
their stuff getting them ready for the test mm -hmm. or their, uh, you know, things that they're going to be tested on. What they need to be educated about is the more time they're spent reading, there again, those test scores are going to go up. Um, they need to know, you, you need to ha gather some of that research up. And so we can, you know, that's something we may share again later. Mm -hmm. Some big research that you have need to have ready and prepared to give your administrators to prove that what you are doing in your classroom is a best practice. The, the silent reading time is practice. Uh, right. As Karen said, it's practice. And in the past, uh, research has been done in classrooms that show in a reading classroom, 70% of the time in that classroom is teacher talk uh, or filling out a worksheet. And really only about 10% of the time is actually practicing the reading. And if you don't practice something, you don't get good at it. Um, years and years and years ago, 25 years ago, my husband and I bought motorcycles. Um, don't don't ask why, but we did. And so we took a motorcycle safety class. It was uh, Friday night and all day Saturday, and then Sunday you graduated. Kind of a short class. Uh, Friday night we saw the movies, Brains on the Highway, you know, that kind of thing. <laughs> we practiced getting on make-believe bikes so we knew where the clutch was, where the brakes were, where, you know, where the gear shifts and, and stuff were. And then Saturday morning, first thing, we were on bikes. We were um, leaping obstacles now not great ones don't it's not Eva Knievel but going over curbs uh, things that suddenly appeared our instructors would step out in front oh of us gosh. God bless them no, wow uh, I, I would never do that especially knowing I was in the class right uh, but by the end of the day I felt that I could control that vehicle and I got a 99 on my driving test so obviously it worked because I practiced it. I knew the theory but you know again uh, what is it there's a big bang theory where Sheldon learns how to swim uh, on the floor so he knows the theory <laughs> and people keep saying that's great if the floor floods you'll be ready uh, but if the flood occurs anywhere else you're not going to be able to swim so in theory we need to know something in practice. Um, Number five, and this always seems to me like something that is, well, of course. This is a well, duh. Uh, yeah, well, duh. Thank you. Or it should yeah, be. It should be. Uh, kids are allowed to borrow books from the classroom library, from the school library, from the public library if one's close. Um, here in Texas, sometimes that's a little problem because they tend yeah. not to be in neighborhoods. That's true. Um, However, that is something you need to mm -hmm. work with, making sure that you kind of have a collaboration mm -hmm. with your public library. Mm -hmm. And there, the kids are familiar with the public library and have a public library card because we all remember trying to get those books in the home, and that's another way to do that. Public librarians are waiting for yes, you they to are. call them. I cannot tell you how many times I've had somebody say, "If they just let us in the school, right. we bring applications, we bring cards." Uh, Houston did that um, about ten years ago. Patrick Jones was working in an outreach program there, and they signed up like thousands upon thousands of kids for cards that they could use at their library. But they need to be able to check them out. That is temporary ownership. And we know that ownership is important. Uh, it allows them to take the book from the classroom, from the school, to the house where there may not be another opportunity. I grew up with books because I had a parent who said, I may not make much, but doggone it, we're going to have lots of books. And we went to the library every two weeks and checked out the maximum number of books. And that's the good thing about the public library, too, is because they let you take stacks. A stack. Yeah. Stacks. And if you take your parent with you, she'll check out some stuff for you. Now, okay, <laughs> so here's what we need to say about the mm -hmm. borrowing of the books. Mm -hmm. You have to let the kids go to the library. Mm -hmm. Little ones being expected to check out their one or two picture books weekly when they go to their library visit is not enough. Those kids are done with those books that night. Their parents read their books to them or they've looked through them and they're ready for new ones the next day. They need to be able to have the opportunity to go to the library, drop those off, and get two more books. I don't care if it's not your library time of the week. They need to have the freedom to go there. And I'm glad you said kindergarten because I've been in schools where kindergartners aren't allowed to check out books because they don't know how to take care of them. Hello, that's your job as a librarian well, and a teacher to teach them how in, to treat books. In part, that's true. But uh, the other piece of it is middle school kids don't oh, take care of too. books either. Uh, <laughs> I just remember Corey, when she got her first autographed book, clutched it, slept with it, wouldn't let anybody else touch it, and she was four. 
at the time. I think she probably still has that book, and I'll bet it's in pretty good shape. And speaking of middle schoolers, I still did the How to Treat Your Book sure. talk at the first time sure. when I met those classes because we've got backpacks, and they go, and they're so busy, and so you, they still have to have the talk of don't put a water bottle in your backpack with your book, <laughs> or don't leave it outside under the tree when it rains. I mean, so they, you're right. Absolutely. The middle schoolers need that too. So they need to be able to check out the books anyhow. Right. Every day. Mm -hmm. um, reading models everywhere. Teachers need to be reading. The librarian needs to be a reader. But not just the English teachers. Mm -hmm. Everybody. The principal needs to be seen reading. The shop, I don't even know if they have shop anymore. Vocational um, ed. Whatever, yeah. <laughs> the uh, math teachers, whatever. Mm -hmm. Everybody needs to be seen as a reader. Your turn, remember, we're building a community of readers. That's not just in your bubble. It's the entire school. And so the conversation needs to be had school-wide with everybody. I was kind of sneaky about that. I started doing um, silent reading uh, as my kids came in from recess uh, for afternoon classes. And they came in hot and sweaty and mm -hmm. just jazzed. And so I had bean bags and pillows and blankets and things like that. And my kids would read for the first 15 minutes mm -hmm. after lunch. Uh, we were in an open concept school, so it was only a matter of time before Miss Coker's class went, why do they get to take a nap after lunch every day? Because they were on the floor. Everybody was assuming they were sleeping. And so Miss Coker came over to talk to me. I said, no, they're, they're reading. And so she said, well, do you want to do what Miss Lassane's class is doing? Yeah. So she started doing it. Then the teacher next to her, next to her. And eventually the principal came in and said, what are you doing? I hear reports of napping in eighth grade. And I said, they're not napping. They're reading. He said, really? I said, yes. Come and sit in the back and watch what happens. Because it was just such a grand thing. And before we knew it, we had dear time, drop everything and read time in our school. Everybody stopped. The administrators would go to a classroom and read silently. Right. The custodians could put down their cleaning equipment and read. There was only one line into the school that was going to be answered for emergencies. Everybody else read. Uh, and I can tell you, it was a wonderful environment. If you want to talk about having a climate of literacy, as I walked into that school, I could tell that, especially as I walked in after lunch and it was silent. Yeah, so teachers, you don't grade your papers no. while the kids are reading. No. Dear time means everybody, everybody is reads. reading. A model reading, model to them what it looks like to be engaged and engrossed in your book. And you can read anything you want. That's the nice thing. I mean... It's really the nice thing about Kindles now because the kids don't necessarily see that you're reading your... Hmm, romance book. novels. <laughs> Romance novels. <laughs> Romance. <laughs> we don't have to apologize for our reading tastes. We don't. Oh, no. Although we, don't. we do tease one another mercilessly oh, from time right, to time. Right, right, right. But it doesn't and matter. Appropriateness at mm -hmm. school as well. Absolutely. You would not tell the kids you were reading that. Definitely yeah. have something else in mind to tell them what you're reading. No Fabio covers at school. That's right. Uh, and I always told kids please don't bring anything to school to read that you would not be reading at home. Right. Because I will check. Because uh, a couple of them said, well, I'll just bring my Playboys. And it's like, <laughs> yeah, middle school. Yeah. They're wonderful. Um, number seven, choice. Choice is an absolute when it comes to building that kind of reading environment. If I'm the one always selecting the books, how do kids ever learn how to select books for themselves? And we see that in, in classrooms mm -hmm. where for year after year after year, kids don't get any choice. They're not the ones going to the bookstore browsing. They're not the ones who are still reading as adults because they don't have to anymore. So as much choice as we can give kids, the better. And especially free choice during those silent reading times, free choice toward what books you're going to take home, free choice toward uh, dear time, wherever you can put choice in, so much the better. Sometimes it's hard because sometimes kids pick books and we just kind of go, but we have to let them because that's how they learn. Yep. Okay, number eight. The kids need to have time to talk to each other about what they're reading. A lot of times that's how they find what they're going to read next. They talk to their peers. Good books travel from kid's hand to kid's <laughs> hand to kid's hand. It's like, oh, so-and-so just had this. I'm checking it out next. And you're like, oh, well, there's a waiting list. You know, it's like, <laughs> there's, I don't know. About that. I guess yeah. I need to buy some more copies. <laughs> right. So, right. So they need to be able to talk to each other about what they're reading. So make that time available to them. Mm -hmm. 
Um, now, of course, we hope they're talking to each other outside of your classroom as well, but where are they going to learn to do that if you're not giving them the time and telling them how to talk about books with each other? You know, we talked a little bit about talking about books in an earlier broadcast mm -hmm. where we talked about not calling a book cute, right. not calling a book colorful, but trying to craft to craft yeah. language there a little bit more. And that is what grown-ups do. We talk about books with one another. We talk about uh, plot. We talk about character development. We talk about... Oh, this line is so... It's yeah. funny. It made me laugh out mm -hmm. loud. Or... This, pers this this part really made me think about mm -hmm. my time when I was in you know high school or whatever. Yeah. I taught in an open uh, concept middle school. Me too. Which means no walls. That's so right. Much fun. Me either. And the person next to me was my good friend Lois Buckman. And she had to become my good friend because she was as loud as I was. So we had to make peace about how we were both going to teach and not have kids constantly going whatever. Mm -hmm. But during silent reading time, we would lean in because our desks were in the front of the room and there was, like I said, no curtain. We would lean over and go, Oh, you need to read this or listen to this and the kids at first were like does my teacher not know how to read so you're reading aloud to her what's going on and we would tell the kids we finally told the kids I said this is this is our talk about the books we're talking about books we love and and passages that just kind of move mm -hmm. us make us laugh make us cry and they were like well share it with us and it, so we started sharing with them um, we were already doing read aloud but these were like just mm -hmm. little bits and right. pieces of books to show them the kinds of things that that made us go oh how did she do that how did that author do that to have that kind of discussion. My husband generally is never interested, or he, well, I have to say, one, one exception. He's not interested in what I read at all. My husband is a typical male reader. Um, I would say he reads for information. Um, I was reading The Matchmaker's Playbook by Rachel Van Dyken the other day, and it's a new adult novel, and it had so many laugh out loud passages that I would have to say, Rich, listen to this. And I would, I would make him listen to these parts, and he's like, oh, yeah, you know. He, of course, he didn't appreciate it very much, but I had to share mm -hmm. it. I had to say it out loud. It was one of, it was, and that's kind of rare. Yeah. It's, it's hard to find a good, funny book. Yeah. And um, that was one. And so I, I was compelled to share, even if I was having to share with someone that really didn't appreciate it. But it was still... The compulsion was there. Give them a few more years. Uh, after 43 years, mine will come to me and say, listen to this. Yeah. Uh, which I, oh, I well, just Oh, now love. Rich does that. It's just that I'm not interested in what oh, he's telling me. Well, that's me. true. I try he's to like, make it. This is, how, this is how I convert um, this diesel running tractor into a <laughs> propane tractor. Like, so. mine, mine is learning more than yeah. probably any husband should, but it doesn't matter. Um, number nine, response should and can take many forms. Um, there's always a joke that goes around, you know, how many of you have read a wonderful book and hands go up in the audience and then you say, and how many of you have made a diorama over that book and all the hands go down? Um, you don't have to have them do a diorama no. every time. <laughs> We've talked about if we could write an app for a diorama, we'd make a fortune in the middle school market. Uh, response can be talk, and actually talk is great. Conferring with uh, somebody else who's read the book, especially a teacher or a, another educator, uh, another person in the, in the school. Response can take the form of simply uh, a recommendation wall. Uh, Donalyn Miller had a wonderful uh, wall that she created where you could write on it with chalk and a metallic marker for great lines from a book that the kids mm -hmm. loved. It can take lots Art. of forms. Art, certainly, just a little shelf talker that says, this book recommended by Karen, yep. and a, a short reason why. It doesn't have to be long. We can assess kids' understanding of books in really short little pieces. And our first response, I just want to remind you, our first response tends to be very personal, very emotional. The book made me laugh, the book made me cry, the book made me think about this, I didn't like this character, I hated when this happened. That's fine. Because we can get from there to the critical response down the road. Yep. Uh, finally, all of those things lead to number 10, which is community. You need to build this community, model this type of community, in order to um, foster the love of reading in our students. Yeah. This, What you're doing by building this community is then allowing them to have the skills and tools they need to be lifelong readers. 
we need to make sure that they don't have that dip in reading when it hits middle school and high school that so often happens. So that's why this kind of community needs to be built, well, like I said already, kindergarten, pre-K. Already they're learning that these are the things that you do when you read a book. You talk, you share, you mm -hmm. have them at home, you borrow, um, you, you go to the public library, all of those things you do. Um, you have a wonderful... Yeah, I was, um, there was a post just this week by Phil Bildner, uh, an, an author that I just adore, and also an author who has a real strong presence in social media, yep. and he's also a huge cheerleader for other authors' books, and I love that. Because while I think social media is the time for you to promote your own, and Phil does, he also says, oh, I just read mm -hmm. Lillian Duncan, and it just knocked me out, and everybody needs to have this book. I love that. But what he said was um, he received a letter recently about Marvelous Cornelius, which is one of his biographies. And he said, I knew immediately it came from a community of readers because it started with, we read your book. He said, it's that pronoun, we. Yeah. Not, I read the book, my teacher read the book to me. We read the book. And I just kind of, you know, that was one of those times where I just sat there and thought, that is so smart. And that just absolutely does identify what goes on? It's, you know, you talk to a student, the student doesn't say, well, Miss Lassane, uh, they say, we, we're reading and we get to choose and we give her a list and she buys the books and those mm -hmm. kinds of things. So if we truly want a community of readers, uh, we do need to be seen not just as an I and a they, an us and a them, but as a we. And mm -hmm. that's sometimes a tough thing to do. Yeah. And it takes time and it takes trust. It does. So. And I'd probably add in here, uh, because I'm sitting next to a school librarian, um, I never became a school librarian. I came to this job in a weird way that we can talk about later. Uh, but I always worked with my school librarian yeah. because my librarian knew so yeah. much and knew many more books than I did, probably still knows more books than I do. So working hand in hand yep. with the librarian in your school, and if you don't have one, you need one. You need to start advocating uh, yeah. for one with your administrators. That's right. And we, again, maybe a future one will talk about that research that's really important there. But work with your school librarian, work with your administrator, with your supervisors, and with your kids and your parents. Yeah. Uh, if you do that, then you really are developing that community. Yeah. Yep. All right. Well, if you have a topic that you think we need to cover, be sure to let us know. Right, us. The email will be in the description below, and we will then see you next time. Bye. Bye.